Up next we have Michael Ann Bradley, and her, the title of her talk is Artificial Intelligence and Suffering. Michael Ann is the Marketing and Communications Manager for the local Provo United Way and specializes in creating systems and operations that enable meaningful social impact. She is passionate about fundraising and online crowdfunding, using technology to foster community and radical self-sufficiency empowered by the internet. In addition to her involvement with the MTA, she serves as treasurer on the board of the, groups, the group LDS Earth Stewardship. She and her husband, Don, live in Provo, Utah. I want to also just thank Michael Ann for her tireless uh, service on behalf of the conference. Uh, she's done a lot of work, so thank you. Okay, so I'm going to be talking today, as mentioned, about um, artificial intelligence. And can you hear me okay? Perfect, I don't. I don't have slides. Perfect, thank you. Um, so my first confession is that I don't know actually very much about artificial intelligence and I'm only a very rudimentary programmer. Um, my hope today is to give you some ideas about um, AI and religion and hopes that someone much smarter than me will take the ideas and develop them. Um, but what kind of spurred my thoughts was um, a blog post I read on um, the Ethical Technology blog um, called Post-Human Desire. It was written by Anthony McCauley. Um, he was talking about, it was part of a broader discussion about the prerequisites for sentient artificial life. Um, the author of this article, Anthony McCauley and others, argued that the experience of the Buddhist um, sensation of of dukkha, or in other words, a combination of suffering and desire, um, is a basic state of all living creatures, and therefore would be requisite for artificial intelligence to also achieve something like sentience. Um, he asks the question, is it even possible to get to the essence of desire um, for such a radically other consciousness? What would happen if, it were, if we were to nest within the cognitive code of an artificial intelligence, dukkha itself? What would be the consequence of an algorithm of desire? This wouldn't be a program with a specific objective. I'm just thinking of desire with no set objective. What if the aspect of the programming were simply to want and keep it open-ended enough that the AI would have to fill in the blank itself? Binary coding may not be able to achieve this, but perhaps in quantum computing, where indeterminacy is an aspect of the program itself, might be possible. Um, so this is a really interesting question, right? Like, if you look at the, the basis of existence for whether it be animals or humans, um, that is desire. And what would it look like to program desire for an AI? Now, I wanted to think for a second about what is the Mormon standard for sentience and existence? And um, what would AI have to be like in order to be sentient conscious from a Mormon perspective? Um, I think it is actually a really potentially fruitful way to, to steer um, artificial intelligence because we've already used mathematics, psychology, linguistics, philosophy, all these things and move us closer towards what a legitimate sentient AI might look like. Um, and I think we need to bring religion into the mix as well. I think religion has at least as much value as philosophy when we're considering um, what consciousness is, what individualism is, what humanity is. So um, my questions are twofold. Within Mormon theology, is sentient AI even like a, like a logical possibility? Is, does theol is our theology give us any, any space for um, a sentient AI? And if we did have a sentient AI, why might, why might that be desirable as opposed to an AI that is simply super intelligent? Um, what, is, what is there that's um, advantageous about being conscious? Um, and just a quick definition, I'm defining sentience as um, the capacity to feel, perceive, or experience subjectively. It's that subjectivity, that kind of um, sense of individualism and 
and meanness that I think um, a computer doesn't currently experience, but I think is essential for um, really powerful artificial intelligence. So let's start from um, a couple basic um, ideas behind Mormon theology. So I think a lot of in this room know that in the Mormon book of Abraham, we learn that God rules over all the intelligences that Abraham's eyes had seen from the beginning. The Lord showed unto Abraham the intelligence that were organized, and among many of these are the noble and great ones. Um, we know that most Mormons interpret this, like, in these intelligences that were before the world existed as a kind of building blocks of a spirit, almost like the atoms of a spirit. And then a spirit comes and inhabits a body, and then that intelligence becomes spirit, become bodies that we see walking around us today. Now, we know that AI, at its most basic level, is information, um, numbers, data. And it's not hard to perceive that then, these kinds of things that we know make up computers, um, as intelligence in raw form. So, so far, so good. Computers, arguably, are at that basic building block of intelligence. And if we can figure out how to cobble those pieces of intelligence together to make a spirit, and then perhaps make a body, we could have um, a computer that was created, a, a, a computer that has achieved intelligence. Now, the other angle I want to look at um, is Mormonism and animals. So, um, looking at animals, to com com well, comparing machines to animals to help us understand consciousness is at least as old as Thomas, Thomas Aquinas, um, who talked about how um, he made the comparison of an arrow moving toward its target is much like an animal moving towards its target, like maybe like a lion moving towards its prey, to show that they're equally without agency. Um, and you can do a lot of comparisons with animals and machines to figure out, like, how are they different than us? How are they the same from us? Um, and I think Mormonism gives us some productive directions there, too. We have a really unique view of animals that actually is not very much at all like what Aquinas stated. Um, President Joseph Fielding Smith, for example, said that Latter-day Saints do not take the view that animals have no reason and cannot think. We have the divine knowledge that each possesses a spirit in the likeness of his body, and that each was created spiritually before it was naturally, or given a body on the earth. Naturally, then, there is some measure of intelligence in members of the animal kingdom. This idea, once again, shows us that there can be different degrees of intelligence, that you can have different degrees of sentience. Um, and there are comparable quotes from Brigham Young and Joseph Smith about how animals have achieved um, a kind of sentience that is both different and same to us. Um, so I think there's room there, again, for a computer, a built kind of intelligence. Now, the last place that Mormon theology makes room for um, a sentient technology is the way that um, we describe objects. This is probably the most interesting um, angle out of the three. Um, we actually have several scriptures that reference objects as experiencing a kind of emotion. In Luke 19.40, um, when Christ is entering Jerusalem um, during Palm Sunday, the Pharisees tell Christ to keep the jubilant crowds quiet. Jesus answers, I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. The stones can recognize another living being. And they can have emotion. They can have joy. Another example, First Nephi 19.12, prophesying um, the coming of Christ later on in the Book of Mormon. And the rocks of the earth must rend, and because of the groanings of the earth, many of the kings of the isles of the sea shall be wrought upon by the Spirit of God to exclaim, the God of nature suffers. Once again, an object can experience and express a kind of awareness of what is going on around it and what it means. Um, the last example, Book of Moses, um, when Enoch sees the earth cry, um, he hears the earth crying out, Woe, woe is me, the mother of men. I am pained, I am weary because of the wickedness of my children. Um, and the, so the earth is aware. The earth has an experience. Um, now, Mormon um, sci-fi writer Orson Scott Card um, was undoubtedly inspired by this story when he wrote about um, this character of this thing in his Earthfall series called The Keeper of the Earth. Um, this description he has of the Keeper of the Earth is incredibly Mormon. I think we can all resonate with it as 
an extension of Mormon concepts and ideas. Um, in his description of the keeper of the earth, he describes it as a benevolent spirit that uses the earth itself, the magma and continents, as a sort of information storage and processing system. Mind and memory lived in the currents of flowing stone in the magnetic flow. Vast amounts of information were deposited in crystals on the underside of the crust, changed by fluxes in temperature and magnetism. Um, I think if you were to do an informal po poll of most Mormons, they would find this wholly compatible with their theology, this idea that intelligence can be stored in something that's not just a human brain, they're not just neurons. There are um, many variations we could imagine that would be able to form an intelligence that could be aware and sentient. Um, so that being said, um, let's just assume for a second that Mormonism the Mormon theology is doing something more than just describing its own particular worldview, but it's actually describing um, some kind, something, something kind of real about, about, about nature and the world as it really is. Um, so let's assume that Mormonism is right, and animals have a kind of spirit, and inanimate objects have a kind of spirit, or in other words, an ability to experience subjectively. And it is, therefore, in the realm of possibility for artificial intelligence to have a spirit and or sentience and or um, subjectivity. What benefit might we have towards striving towards a sentient AI as opposed to a simply super intelligent AI, one that can do better math problems or solve better algorithms? Um, we know right now that um, complex real world problems remain well beyond the grasp of computers. Humans themselves have been unable to solve these issues and so we can't program something to do something that we can't even do ourselves. We can't even provide computers with the instructions to follow or even delineate the goals that our computers need to achieve. Technology as it now exists can only work with what it is given. So the problem is it's a problem that we need simply better algorithms, better logic, or better methodologies. Maybe. Um, right now though, I think in an attempt to make I um, more, more fruitful, it seems to work better to make it more like a human with embodied agent approaches, um, neural net research, statistical approaches to mimic the probabilistic nature of the human ability to guess. Um, our attempt to make computers more like us, more like humans, is it simply that we don't know how to be other than human. We can't quite bring ourselves to have the imagination to think what an intelligence would look like um, other than us. Um, that may or may not be true, that we, we are un unable to imagine that. I think we need to move towards that, and I think looking at things from a Mormon perspective gives us um, at least the idea that it could be possible. That being said, I think the ways that Mormon theology describes what um, sentient objects and animals and so forth, what makes them sentient, is there again sub subjectivity in their emotion, their ability to experience. The rocks can cry out, the earth can groan. And we're learning through research that emotion provides an invaluable role in providing information, improving speed of decision making, and assessing relevance, and enhancing commitment. A subjective artificial intelligence, or in other words, a sentient one, one that could react to its environment and experience its experience emotion, might be key to enabling artificial intelligence to solve some of the complex real-world problems. Um, so I think what we come to at the end, actually, what I think is probably going to be the most fruitful direction for us to go when trying to leverage our technology to be able to solve some of the most complex problems is um, to not go the direction of just mimicking humans' probable nature, or probabilistic nature, and our, our ability to guess with statistics and so forth, um, and not to simply mimic our brains by doing more neural net research. I think what's actually going to be the most fruitful is to be able to integrate technology with ourselves more, to take the best of what it is that we can experience as humans with all of our emotion and subjectivity, but leverage artificial intelligence to um, accommodate for the, the various weaknesses that we might have as human beings. Um, our, 
our tendency to make irrational decisions, um, our tendency to be short-sighted. Um, this is what we popularly call cyborgs, and I think and this mismatch right, of, of, of um, emotion and, and uh, computer mechanics. Um, I, think, I think striving towards an artificial intelligence that is separate from us, that can do its own thing, is valuable, but I think um, being able to mix the human and the technological is probably the most realistic in terms of what could actually be accomplished and actually be beneficial. Um, so just in conclusion, um, I hope that we, as we are considering ways to make our world better, I hope we don't forget to include religion as a possibility um, of inspiration and a possibility to give us an idea of what direction we need to go next to be able to solve some of our most complex problems. Thank you very much.